Estimates are that there are roughly 5,000 species of mammals alive today, plus more than 10,000 species of reptiles, not including birds, of which there are another 10,000 species or so. Then there are another 7,600 amphibians, amounting to roughly 33,000 mostly terrestrial tetrapods altogether. That doesn't account for fish or insects with a vast majority of life on Earth, only the relative few that the biblical authors would recognize as having the breath of life. You see, back then, people didn't know that air was particulate matter. They thought air was a tangible spiritual life force and that the act of breathing caused one to be infused with the spirit, which brings one to life, because they figured out that a lot of animals will die if they can't breathe. So the fable says that all the animals that had the breath of life would come to Noah to be saved from the flood. Thus, the first thought you might have is that Noah loaded 66,000 individual animals onto a box that couldn't possibly hold them all. Of course, the people who wrote this story uh, weren't thinking globally. They had no idea that Australia or the Americas even existed, so they didn't know about penguins, polar bears, bison, wallabies, or three-toed sloths, which would never have been able to make the trip to Mesopotamia. Many islands have species that exist only there and nowhere else. How would they distribute them back again? How would they get the dragons to Komodo, tortoises to Galapagos, the Tuatara back to New Zealand? Uh, at the time that this was supposed to have happened, there were still woolly mammoths on an island north of eastern Russia. The people who made up the story didn't know about any of them. They were only aware of a relatively few animals that lived in their immediate area, which their royalty might have kept in a menagerie. The story also says that Noah was supposed to load at least seven pairs of each of the clean animals, meaning the livestock that they kept to eat. Uh, these would be herd animals that chew the cud and have a divided hoof, such as cattle, deer, goats, and sheep. But they also loaded domestic fowl like chickens, geese, ducks, and whatever other birds these people thought were good to eat. They brought at least seven pairs of each of those on top of two of every other kind of bird. So how many are we up to now? <laughs> who knows? The people who made up the story obviously didn't know, so how could we? How are they supposed to house walruses and sea turtles that can't be left in the ocean for a year and can't spend a year on a boat either? And what were all these things supposed to eat? As we mentioned in the last video, without refrigeration or any means of preservation, it would not have been possible to store enough food just for the livestock, not for a whole year. And there wasn't much thought given to the wild animals either. How do you feed them? What are koalas and anteaters and bats and earthworms supposed to eat? What about the termites? <laughs> they're the only ones with abundant food, but they're not allowed to eat it. Well, parasites had plenty of food too, didn't they? Do you think these animals accidentally carried on only one male and one female of each species of fleas, ticks, lice, mites, mosquitoes, and intestinal worms? You think maybe God could have not given them a ticket to board? How can you have just one male and one female termite? Or just two of every species of ant or bee? That just doesn't work. That's why Answers in Genesis ignores the insects, saying that they didn't have to be saved on the ark because they didn't have lungs. But they still breathe, and they'll drown, and we still have them. So if this fable was true, then how did they make it? And what about the predators? A single lion eats 10 pounds of meat a day. So for every individual carnivore of that size, you'd need to load another large 3,600-pound bovine just to last one year. Once you've got a few lions and hyenas, wolves and bears and other such things on board, there go all your clean animals. They'll have to share one cow every day with another waiting in line to be killed tomorrow. Even with just a few large predators, it would still take a herd of hundreds of cattle to last one year. And even if you could keep all the predators fed for the duration of the deluge, they'd eat up all the prey in the first month back on shore. There's just no way any of this works. If you see this as a provincial legend about a localized flood, then the proportions are not so absurd. But creationists tend to demand a worldwide flood with every species from every continent till the story no longer floats. Young Earth creationists go even further and throw dinosaurs in there too, along with every other terrestrial animal in the fossil record. They don't know what that means. It's not just that a couple of sauropods would have been too big for the ark all by themselves. It's that there are hundreds of species of dinosaurs and thousands more species of mammal-like reptiles, giant anapsids, terror birds, and several enormous ancient mammals which these religious extremists don't know anything at all about. Since young earth creationists reject the entirety of geologic history, they're determined to make believe that everything was magically created all at once and that dinosaurs lived alongside people, at least in the Bible times. 
They're also determined to distort the Bible into mentioning dinosaurs. For example, the book of Job mentions Leviathan, Behemoth, and the unicorn. I know. The traditional joke is that the unicorn didn't make it on the ark, and that's why we don't have any today. But back in the Bronze Age, people had a very different idea of what a unicorn was. The Latin name of this animal is Dicerus bicornis, and this one is called Rhinocerus unicornis. This is a unicorn. And bearing this in mind, read Job 39 again in the King James Bible. It makes a lot more sense when you see it as this instead of this. Likewise, the next chapter describes Behemoth as an elephant whose tail bends or sways like a Middle Eastern cedar. It does not describe the size of the tail, nor in any way imply that it should look like a North American cedar, nor could the authors have even thought that. Instead, they said that the sinews of his stones are wrapped together and his nose pierces snares, or in other translations, they're trying to snare his nose. For these and other reasons, we know that this is an elephant. These traits are unique to elephants, and this is not the way anyone would describe a sauropod. But young earth creationists insist on lying about that, so they can try to make this into a dinosaur. If you read the next chapter, Job's description of Leviathan is obviously based on a Nile crocodile, albeit with some magical embellishments. Every other reference to a dragon is either talking about a snake or a multi-headed monster. There are no dinosaurs in the Bible. The only dinosaurs that ever lived alongside men are birds, and creationists refuse to admit the fact that birds are dinosaurs. But let's imagine for a moment that every species that ever lived was alive at the same time. There are so many genera evident in the fossil record that what we have left today represent only about 1% of everything that has ever lived. Thus, an already exaggerated tall tale goes from overloaded to overbloated and collapses under the weight of its own impossibility. Noah would need a fleet of arcs that size, a whole navy. Not everything had to be on the ark because a lot of these were seagoing creatures, but then what happened to all the ammonites and trilobites, pliosaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, mosasaurs, placodonts, crinoids, eurypterids, and other things that are now entirely extinct? If God wanted to save any of these species, he certainly went about it the wrong way, didn't he? When Ansos and Genesis built their fake ark in Kentucky, they quickly realized that they couldn't even house a decent zoo in that boat-shaped building, not without extensive and expensive provisions, more than any crew of eight could have possibly managed or stored, even with modern appliances. And without air conditioning and much more ventilation than their fable allowed, everyone would have died of methane poisoning within the first couple of days. So, instead of including a zoo with real animals, which would have been a much better attraction, they opted to create a few dozen stuffed animals instead, which really wasn't worth the ticket price. Now, these included a pair of dromaeosaurs, but without any feathers, of course, because they don't want people to know that dinosaurs were so bird-like. They know better, but they're not going to be honest about that because it's all about make-believe and they need to keep their people ignorant. Now, they also had Mesohippus and Pachycetus and Calicotherium, and the reason for that is confusing. Being forced to defend an increasingly, obviously indefensible myth, young earth creationists painted themselves into a corner and used an unlikely excuse as their only escape. They realized that evolution was the only explanation they could use to reconcile all these impossibilities. The fact that finally clued Darwin to the idea that one species could diversify into many was the discovery of a collection of finches from the Galapagos archipelago. All the island birds were derivations of a common ancestor on the mainland. So if you only had that archetype, then that one species is as good as the 14 that evolved from it. So AIG said that they didn't need tens of thousands of species on their ark, just a few common ancestors from which they could derive everything else. Creationists don't believe in gradual evolution over millions of years, but they'll evoke a super-fast, hyper-accelerated evolution happening in only a century or so if they need that type of excuse. If one lineage of dogs can produce a hundred or a couple hundred recognized breeds, then one lineage of bears could produce every other species of bear, and so on. So how many cats were on the ark? Surely they didn't have every species of cat known to man, not when they're all the same kind. Why would you have two felines and two panthers and two scimitar cats when you could derive all three groups just from one breeding pair of proto-kitties, like a pair of prehistoric nimvirids, for example? These are a group of almost cats from the Eocene epoch. How long would it take, on a young Earth creationist timescale, for these to evolve into all the cats we have today? 
Well, there's a problem with that. Answers in Genesis said the flood happened less than 4,400 years ago, but we already had depictions of both lions and leopards with different kinds of house cats long before then. So each of these species already existed before the flood that never happened. Likewise, Pachycetus is taxonomically basal to the entire ancestry of whales. But if you're going to allow evolution to derive all these descendants and whales could have been left in the ocean, then why would you include a whale ancestor on the ark? Oh, yeah, because the magic book of fables says that whales were created as they are on the fifth day. But then, why did they have mesohippus, an intermediate stage in the evolution of horses? Why not derive all horses starting from the beginning with eohippus or hyracotherium? In fact, if you went just a bit further, you could have had cambatherium, a taxonomic precursor of horses, rhinos, and calicotheres. So why did they have all three of those on the Ark Encounter? Oh yeah, because their rhino cage was labeled unicorn. They had to do that in order to lend some credence to the fable. But the idea was that they could stock the boat with just a few basal precursors that could later branch into all the modern varieties. Well, except for dinosaurs, of course. They had already diversified into hundreds of species, and, and all of them became extinct immediately as soon as they stepped off the boat, along with more than 90% of everything else that ever lived. How's that for divine guidance? I know the Lord works in delirious ways, but having a shipment where almost everything is dead upon arrival is not survival. And creationists don't have a problem with microevolution, that's variation within species, but they're forbidden to admit macroevolution, which is variation between species, uh, evolution at or above the species level. So they used to say that speciation was impossible until they found out that it has actually happened a bunch of times. So they moved the goalposts such that the evolution of a new species of finch are just changes within a kind. By mislabeling and misappropriating evolution in this way, Answers in Genesis figured they could generate every species alive today out of only 1,400 original archetypes on the Ark, which they consider to be specially or magically created kinds. The Bible never says what a kind is. It says there are many different kinds of all sorts of birds, but it doesn't say what a sort is either, nor why there are different kinds within a kind. Why aren't they all the bird kind? Otherwise, everything is either cattle or beasts or sea monsters or creeping things. The people who cobbled together the Bible had no idea how to classify anything. They define things by what they do rather than what they are. So the Bible says that whales are fish and that bats are birds, and bats might occasionally be locusts too because of the way they swarm. Who knows? Of course, now we have a way of classifying life forms by what they are, by analyzing their morphology, physiology, development, and genetics, which also allows that evolution can be traced, so that things can be classified by their ancestry indicated in the genome. We see this demonstrated with the molecular phylogeny of living primates, a computer-generated cladogram based on analysis of multiple types of genetic markers, which confirms our familial relationship as one of the great apes. Of course, we've sequenced the genes of other organisms, too, and they show a similar pattern. Studies of louse DNA show that human head lice diverged from chimpanzee body lice at about the same time that humans diverged from chimpanzees. Not surprising. But human pubic lice diverged from gorilla lice, and much more recently. How awkward is that? Genomic research consistently reveals evolutionary patterns throughout zoology. For example, I made a two-part video series on the evolution of cats and another one on the evolution of dogs, in which I referenced a number of chemically constructed cladograms, including a massive collaborative analysis of the molecular phylogeny of carnivora. This used two different types of genetic analysis to confirm that cats are definitely related to meerkats, bear cats, and pole cats, as well as dogs, bears, seals, weasels, hyenas, and so on. So they're not different kinds, they're all the same kind. And so it goes with genetic orthologs linking every animal group in an unambiguous family tree that is also connected to other forms of life. Everything about phylogenetics is an inconvenient truth for creationists trying to avoid the truth, but it gets worse. Genomic research also shows periods of population reduction with measured mutation rates to indicate when. These are consistent enough that comparative genomics of different populations shows that about 12,000 years ago, some unidentified cataclysm wiped out about three quarters of most large mammals. This is not concordant with the flood, either in timing or effect. Some species went extinct, 
Some came through all right, but cheetahs barely survived, meaning that so few of them made it through that there was a population bottleneck, causing a loss of genetic diversity. This left cheetah DNA with the deficiency of being effectively inbred. But that was 12,000 years ago, thousands of years before the world existed, according to young earth science deniers, and cheetahs are still suffering this effect. Now, if there was a global flood, it wouldn't just be cheetahs. Every terrestrial vertebrate would be similarly deficient. Studies of the human genome show that we've experienced a number of bottlenecks too, mostly associated with migration combined with a number of environmental factors. The most significant of these was more than 70,000 years ago when the entire human population was reduced to only a few thousand individuals. Imagine how much worse it would be if, there were, if it were ever down to just two individuals, one male and one female, such that all their descendants had to be incestuous. If there had ever been a global flood, then every species would be severely compromised by a lack of genetic diversity, if anything survived, and as we explained in previous videos, nothing would have made it past that, not even the animals on the ark. It's not like creationists are ever going to admit that anything ever proves them wrong, because everything does, and they've already made public statements to the effect that they don't care what the truth is, they're going to close their eyes to that and make believe whatever they want to believe. So what they did was adapt Linnaean taxonomy into a bogus pseudoscience called baromenology. This holds that normal taxonomic hierarchies of evolution are correct, and thus the phylogenetic tree of life is correct, but only to a point after which they say that everything comes down to an estimated 1,400 original kinds from which everything else is derived. But they will not disclose where that point is. It used to be the species level until they found out the speciation happens. Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis admits that he arbitrarily moves that point around such that it is usually the species level, but sometimes he'll push it back to the family level, ignoring the fact that humans are still in the family of apes which he's already said he will never admit despite any amount of proof to the contrary. This is critical. If evolution from common ancestry is not true and some flavor of special creation of as yet unidentified kinds is true, then there would be some surface levels in a cladogram where you would accept an actual evolutionary ancestry, but there must also be subsequent levels in that twin nested hierarchy where life forms would no longer be the same kind and wouldn't be biologically related anymore. At that point, they would be magically created separate kinds and distinctly unique from those listed around it, as well as those apparently ancestral to it. So creationists have to show at least a handful of these baromans and show how we can distinguish them from their parent categories. This is the phylogeny challenge, the most damning argument there is against creationism, and no creationist can meet that challenge because they know this mystic boundary they allude to isn't really there. They made it up in an attempt to deny an abundantly evident reality.